tonight. Uh, our scripture reading tonight is uh, found in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let's pray. Father, we um, come before you and we are thankful for uh, this evening. Lord, thank you that we can gather here together um, and uh, celebrate communion. Lord, we are so thankful uh, for your son, Jesus. We would not be here today. We would not be who we are without him and his love for us his um, obedience, even unto death. Lord, thank you for um, pulling us out of our pit and giving us life. Lord, I, I pray that as we go throughout our week and, and our life, Lord, we would be more concerned with heavenly things than, than things on here on earth. That one day when we see you, we will stand face to face and we will hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Lord, we would be able to cast down crowns at your feet. And Lord, I, I am so thankful for forgiveness of our sins. Lord, how we can stand before you with Christ's righteousness. And Lord, I pray that um, you would be with the service tonight, that we would uh, gain the proper understanding of what it is to um, enter into communion with you. And Lord, that it would even change the way we think about it. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just real quick, uh, teens, if uh, you are planning on going on the activity uh, this Friday night, make sure that you, you're signed up for that. And the cost is $10 if you could bring that on Wednesday night. And then also we do uh, need to do a, a permission slip through Sky Zone. So make sure that your parents fill that out if you're under the age of 18. Good evening. 
We uh, do have a dish to pass next Sunday afternoon. First one we've had that we will have had since uh, the COVID shutdown. So it's been a long time. Also, next Sunday, we have guest speakers. They're ABW missionaries uh, to Liberia. Uh, the, the Britons, Bill and Kathy, they've actually been here before, but they're going to be here, uh, and he'll, uh, he will be speaking for both services. Okay, so we'll have our morning service. Normal Sunday school, morning service, dish to pass, followed by an afternoon service. And that is next Sunday's plan. All right, so looking forward to that. We pray about that. Look forward to good fellowship. Why don't we sing hymn number 305, Jesus Paid It All, fitting him for our communion service tonight. Jesus Paid It All. Let's all stand and sing this one.
Amen. Thank you, youth group. Praise the Lord. Another good song for a communion service. We're just focusing on the Lord and uh, what he did, and that's really what communion is all about. That's important to know. And when, when the Apostle Paul addressed the church at Corinth regarding communion or the Lord's Supper, he, he did that in chapter 11, verse 27 to 29. says, Therefore, whoever eats this cup or eats his bread or drinks his cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the lord's body twice in those three verses did you notice that paul mentioned an unworthy manner coming to the lord's table in an unworthy manner and it is uh, it is defined in verse 29 as not discerning the lord's body that's how you come to the communion table in an unworthy manner one way is to not discern the Lord's body. Um, what does that mean, to discern? Just simply to, uh, to differentiate or identify. Simply put, what he's saying is it is failure to identify what Christ did for you when you come to the table. Right? So it's really important for all of us to uh, take a closer look at the communion table from time to time and understand specifically what it is all about in, in relation to what Christ did on cross on the cross because your approach to the communion table is going to dis, is going to dis demonstrate whether or not you discern the Lord's body um, I want to look at three different approaches to the communion table that are that are held by people only one is supported by scripture what are these three approaches to the communion table well I'll have you turn to the book of John, chapter 6, and be ready there for a moment, okay? John chapter 6. But the first view teaches that at the time of communion, which is momentarily here at Open Door, when you approach the communion table, the time, that's the time of communion, this view teaches that at the time of communion, the bread and the juice or the wine are transformed into the actual flesh and the blood of Christ. This is known as transubstantiation. Transubstantiation in which the elements of the table transform into the body of Christ. The earliest known teaching of transubstantiation was by a man named Hildebert, De Sarvedon, he was the Archbishop of Tours around the 11th century. That's the earliest known teaching of transubstantiation. Right? And by the 12th century, the teaching had grown very widespread. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. And then, view number two. This is another two, uh, view of the Lord's table. This is different from transubstantiation in that it teaches that Christ is not physically in or becoming the bread and the juice or the wine, but rather Christ's body and blood are spiritually with the bread and the juice or the wine. This is called consubstantiation. Con meaning with alongside of, or lying just underneath the surface. Right? So what it says is when we come to the communion table, at the time we do that, Christ's body and blood thereby come alongside of and are with these elements. This teaching was, was most likely a reaction to transubstantiation, because it originated, as far as church historians know, in the 13th century by a scholastic theologian named Duns Scotus. The, one of the great church reformers, Martin Luther, he helped popularize the, this view of communion. 
he believed this view of communion and, and he popularized it immensely. What texts are used to support these views? Well, they're actually both supported by the same texts, actually. One is there in John chapter 6, where we read, start with verse 53. John chapter 6, verse, verse 53, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And notice verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Man, if you don't understand what he's talking about, that can seem like a very grotesque passage of Scripture. This is the stuff vampire movies are made of. And so you have to understand the context, right? And then that compared with Luke chapter 22, if you want to flip ahead to Luke, or flip back rather to Luke 22, and look at verse... Uh, Look at verses 19 and 20, Luke 22, 19 and 20, which was when Christ instituted the Lord's table. And, he, and it says, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Okay, here's the logic behind this. Christ offered himself as a means of salvation and as a means of forgiveness for our sins. All right, the wrath-removing sacrifice, and this is true. This is true. Um, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. So it is absolutely true that Jesus Christ gives himself as an offering for uh, the forgiveness of our sins and for our eternal life. So the logic says this. Communion, then, is the means by which one accepts Christ's offer. And since you can't literally eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood, uh, because he's not here or wait, he is. He's in the elements. This is how you eat and drink and thereby receive Christ's offering of himself. And in so doing, you find forgiveness of sins and you find uh, salvation. Okay? And therefore, the logic goes in Luke 22, this is what he meant when he said, this is my body, when he held up the bread. Okay? And uh, the logic says he was literally offering his body in the bread. Okay, so both transubstantiation and consubstantiation use these passages, and they both teach that the communion table is Christ's offering of himself for the forgiveness of sins and for salvation every time you take it. Every time you come to the communion table, Christ is offering himself. That's how the logic goes, okay? The two views only differ in their mechanics. One emphasizing the physical, literally transforms. One emphasizing the spiritual, as body and blood goes along with the elements. But they are the same in their intent in that both say the communion table is an offer of Jesus Christ to forgive you of sins, to wash you, and to offer salvation to those who do not, do not know the Lord as Savior. Now, here are the problems with these two views. In John chapter 6, the communion table is not the subject of what Jesus is talking about. John chapter 6 took place early on in his ministry. The communion table was presented at the end of his ministry 
at the last Passover meal that he shared with his disciples and shortly before he went to the cross. So way at the beginning, when he was speaking of this, the communion table wasn't anywhere around. Also, if we are to take literally the eating of Christ's flesh and blood as a means for salvation, if we are to take literally that those elements are his flesh and are his blood, then we also have to take literally that same context in which Christ called himself bread in verse 48, in which he is not bread. It was figurative language. The topic of this account is not the communion table here in John chapter 6. The topic is eternal life. To receive eternal life, one must receive Christ. That's the subject of his discussion, of his sermon, of what he was preaching to these, these people. He was telling them that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And you have no part in eternal life unless you receive him. And how, pray tell, does one receive him according to passage after passage after passage after passage of Scripture? It isn't by eating anything. You receive Christ by faith. Right? That's how. This was figurative language. And Christ was using bread as an illustration to picture this truth. This would have been a a really meaningful illustration to those people back then, far more than it is to us. Why? The bread of life, folks, bread was the staple of their diet. These people ate grain. That was mostly what they ate, okay? And the idea of taking away their grain or, or taking away their bread, you just took away their life. And so when Christ is going to use an illustration of the importance of life, what better than bread? As bread was a necessity to their physical life, Jesus Christ is the necessity to our spiritual life. That doesn't make as much sense to us, or I should say it, it makes sense, but it doesn't hit us as hard, because in this day and age, bread is not the staple of life, is it? We eat all kinds of things. Uh, you go to the grocery store, it's amazing what we have at our disposal. We can eat so much, um, but... That has not been the case in world history. Bread has really been the staple of most cultures, hasn't it? The, the bread's a little different from culture to culture. Um, in the Hispanic culture, the bread is a tortilla. Right? That, that is the staple of historical Mexican culture, tortillas. In fact, Mexicans don't only eat the tortilla, they use it for their silverware. Did you know that? Tear off a piece and you use it as a shovel pick up the rice and the beans. And this is how Mexicans eat. I grew up around this. My grandpa De Leon uh, could not stand to eat with his fingers. He was a weird Mexican. Uh, he ate everything with flatware. Embarrassed my grandma so bad when they went to a restaurant. Once all the people all around, he ate a donut with a knife and fork. Just embarrassed her to no end. But typically Mexicans don't do that. But that's their bread. And every culture has bread. The Jews had their bread. And so this, made a, this, this really hit home with them, made an impact when Christ said, I'm the bread of life. You want spiritual life, and you've got to consume me. That makes sense, doesn't it? Okay. In the Luke account, Luke chapter 22, he was speaking of the communion table. He absolutely was. It was the first presentation of the communion table. It was the last Passover meal but the first communion. If the communion table, though, is a continued offering, because that's what both transubstantiation and consubstantiation teach, that the communion table is a continuation of that which began on the cross. Okay? He died on the cross 2,000 years ago, and these elements are a continuation of that, because every time... We come to this, they say, Christ is offering himself. If that's so, then we have some problems. Okay? We have the problem of John chapter 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, and he's on the cross at this point, he said, 
it is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. What was finished? That which he came to earth to do. To be the propitiation or the wrath-removing sacrifice for the sins of the world. And how did he do that? On the cross. And what did he just call that work of the cross before he died? A finished work. It's done. And that which is done is done. You don't repeat it. You don't continue it. It's finished. You also have to consider Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. It says, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Verse 18, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. No more. So the conclusion is both transubstantiation and consubstantiation fail to discern the Lord's body. Why? Because both teach that Christ's offer for the forgiveness and remission of sins is a continuing event that happens every time we come here. But we are told repeatedly in the scripture that event was accomplished 2,000 years ago and there is no longer another offering ever again. That's your eternal security, folks. This is why you will never lose your place in the body of Christ, ever. Because if you did, then Christ would have to come back here and pay for your sin all over again to get you resaved, and he's not going to do that. It was once for all. You're secure. May I suggest a third view of what is happening when we come to the communion table? Back to Luke 22. When Christ said, in verse 19, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood which is shed for you. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 11, he also said, do this in remembrance of me. So instead of transubstantiation and consubstantiation, I present to you the view that is called representation. Representation in which these elements do not transform into the body and the blood of Christ. These elements do not contain in some way the body and blood of Christ, but these elements represent the body of Christ. And you know, they don't even really represent the blood because Christ said it is the cup that represents the new covenant. It is secured in his blood, but the cup itself in which we all share, and that's actually what they did. <laughs> they shared that cup. Uh, but this cup, which we all share, is a picture of the fact that we all share in the same covenant promise of Jesus Christ, the promise of eternal life and salvation. Right? Remembrance is the key here. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So when he said, this is my body, this cup is the new covenant, he was asking us to look at these things as representatives of him and what he has done for us on that cross, making this a picture. Well, you can relate to that. If I show you on my desk, you would see there is a picture of my family. There's Naomi and my three boys, and uh, I could show you that, and what would I say? I'd say, oh yeah, that's my family. What do I mean when I point to that and I say, that's my family? Well, you know what I mean. I don't mean that's literally Naomi and Samuel and Slater and what's the tall skinny one's name, Solomon. You know, I don't literally mean that. What I mean is that is a picture of my family and everybody understands that, right? So when Christ held out that bread and said, this is my body, remembrance is the key, he meant this is a picture. Pictures are wonderful for remembering. It is absolutely wonderful for that. 
Why is it, folks, that you will every now and then grab that photo album and sit down and just start thumbing through it? You don't do it a lot, do you? But when you do, it turns into a flood of memories and days gone by. When your kids look different, when your parents look different, when you look different. There's a reason you do that. Pictures are wonderful for remembering. This is why you got to get those very important photos to you off of your phone, develop them and get them in an album because nobody's ever going to grab your phone and say, let me just see what's going on in the family. That's just something that doesn't happen too often. But your photo album, it just floods you with memories. All right. And so this was a picture of, this is a picture of what Christ did. It's not his body. Right? It's not his blood. It's just a representation. Now, some feel that this representation or this symbolism cheapens the Lord's table as if simply because it's a picture, it makes the Lord's table unimportant. Well, some soldiers that go off to war do so with families. My dad did. He, didn't, he was in the Air Force three years, had one year to go. During that three years, he got married and had a little boy. And... Uh, that last year of service, they shipped him off to Vietnam, and he left my mom and me back home. That happens, and uh, soldiers go off to war, and they have, they have often a family back home. What do such soldiers often take with them? They take a picture, don't they? All right. If it's infantrymen, they keep that in the breast pocket of their uniform, maybe. Helicopter pilot, they keep it on the dash, in the tank. If they're Navy, they have it somewhere where they can see it, in the sub or on the ship. They keep those with them everywhere they go. If things get really bad and hairy, you know, everybody's gonna, he's got to evacuate that tank, takes that picture with him. He checks, he's an infantryman, to see that it's there. He always wants to know. Now, you, you, you tell me. How is that soldier going to react over there if he loses that picture? What do you think? Do you think to him that picture is serious? Oh, it absolutely is. The picture is meaningful and it is in no way cheapened because it is only a representation of the people he loves. Not at all. It is all the more important to him because the people he loves are not there. But the picture is. Well, you have Christ dwelling in your heart. He is with us always. But physically, physically we have to wait till the day when we see him face to face, can see the scars in his hands with our own eyes and can touch him. As far as that goes, he's not here. But the picture is, Oh, it's not a cheap picture at all, folks. This is, in fact, an important picture. And that's how you approach the communion table and properly discern the Lord's body with remembrance. Father, we just thank you for our undeserved eternal life is found only in Jesus Christ. Ask as we prepare our hearts to gather around this table together as believers that we do so with joy and seriousness of the reality and the gravity of this wonderful representation of our risen Savior in whose name I pray. Amen. As we get ready for that and the guys come, why don't we sing um, hymn number 312, Calvary covers it all. Well, let's go ahead and stand just for this hymn and then we'll sit for the communion table. Calvary covers it all. 312 in heaven.
tonight it is, it is even more special to um, approach the communion table because it's been refreshed in our minds. And as we um, come before it as a remembrance, this is not uh, an uh, instruction for those that are members of this church. This is for the church. This is a command given to us in Scripture. And you do not have to be a member of Open Door to partake in communion. But you do need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is uh, for the children of God, those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. And so um, if you have never done that before, if you don't know what that even means, I'd ask you to not partake in this communion, but to immediately come and talk to us afterwards. And we would love to share with you the gospel. But as we uh, prepare for this, um, a number of passages were read. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, it talks about how uh, Jesus came in that night. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pass out the elements here. I'm going to ask Alan to pray for the bread, um, and then we're going to pass it out, and we're going to partake. Alan, will you pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that uh, the creator God, the sustainer of all manner and all things, would allow his body to be broken by those he created. And you allowed that because you loved us so, that you had to be that sacrifice. And I thank you.
the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the bread, they, they took the juice. And I'm going to ask Jeremiah uh, to pray for the juice this evening. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, I was thinking while we were taking this, of what this means. And I think oftentimes we can come to communion and have almost a sobering mentality, but we can also come to communion with the thought of victory. Our sin, once for all, was taken care of. Death no longer has to sting. Our struggles, our temptations that we face will one day end. 
and we will all be for eternity with Jesus Christ. And we think of what Christ did on the cross for us. And he said, it is finished. That is joyful. That is, that is our battle cry. And while we're here on this earth, it is, a, it is a battle, but it's already been won. And each time that we get to take communion, we get to remember that. Well, let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to close in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Well, let's pray. Father, we are so thankful uh, for your son, Jesus. We are thankful for the cross. We are thankful for the resurrection. Uh, we are thankful for the hope that we have for eternal life. And Lord, as it's been said tonight, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. I wasn't sure if you wanted.